Welcome everybody to the 12th lecture in our summer lecture series titled From the Rooftops. These lectures are coming to you from the Landscape Architecture Department here in the Weizmann School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. My name is Richard Weller, I'm the chair of the department and today it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Nick Pevsner. Nick is a full-time senior lecturer in the Department of Landscape Architecture. He's also the co-editor-in-chief of Scenario Journal, an online publication devoted to showcasing and facilitating the emerging interdisciplinary conversations between landscape architecture, urban design, engineering and ecology. Prior to joining Penn, he was a senior designer at the landscape architecture firm Michael Van Valkenburg & Associates in New York City. Nick's research focuses on the energy landscape and the public and civic potential of energy-related infrastructure. At Penn, he has taught core studios in the urban design and elective studios on the territorial landscape potential of energy infrastructure. He also teaches core subjects in urban ecology. Nick Pevsner holds a Bachelor of Architecture from the Cooper Union and a Master of Landscape Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. So please join me in welcoming Nick Pevsner to the digital lectern for today's lecture. Enjoy the lecture. Hello everybody, I'm Nick Pevsner and I'm a senior lecturer in the Landscape Architecture program here at Penn. Today I'll be talking about the energy landscape and why this is an urgent topic today in the midst of our global energy transition to renewable energy. And I'll articulate the role of landscape as a central battleground for climate action. 15 years ago, Hurricane Katrina was a wake up call to the devastation that happens when powerful natural disasters meet failures of engineering and policy. Since then, it has become increasingly clear that we're in a climate emergency, which will continue to ramp up the destructive power of natural disasters and amplify existing inequalities in our society. It is also becoming clear that already vulnerable communities, so low-income communities, communities of color, and poorer countries in the global south, are projected to suffer disproportionate harm from climate stressors. This was one year ago exactly, in the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas. So, the climate emergency has produced two main buckets of strategies for climate action, some of them um, seen as within the designer's purview. For the better part of the last 15 years since Katrina, landscape architects and urban designers have really focused on climate adaptation, on reducing the exposure of communities to climate change stresses, whether those are from flooding, um, but also more recently from fire, from heat waves, um, and the like. The claim, the claim that designers can assist with climate mitigation is newer, and the landscape profession is really still grappling with where it can produce any meaningful, any meaningful change here. Both of these buckets of climate action are necessary and urgent, but the extent of our collective success with mitigation will dictate the magnitude of adaptation that will be needed, and whether or not adaptation can even keep up. So my work on energy landscapes sits within the climate mitigation camp. And we know that to get the kind of climate mitigation that lets the planet stay below two degrees Celsius, um, this will entail massive, really unprecedented in global history kinds of technological shifts. The world will need to muster a wholesale decarbonization of the world's economies and power grids and of entire sectors like heavy industry and construction, of the building sector, of transportation, of agriculture. So we can broadly sum these strategies up as decarbonization of high carbon processes like cement manufacturing and traditional agriculture, electrification of as many fossil fuel based processes as possible, and cleaning up the electric grid for uh, you know, the electricity that is going to be powering all of those newly electrified processes. And so in terms of the energy transition, um, we understand that some technologies like renewable energy will continue to see explosive growth and some technologies like fossil fuels will hopefully see virtual elimination by mid-century. And as more and more sectors seek to electrify everything, there will be increasing demand for clean electricity in the coming 30 years. 
Now, questions of energy infrastructure are most often considered through the lens of financing or technological constraints. But while these things are vitally important, they leave out another factor, which is space and its cultural considerations. So within the next 30 years of all out decarbonization, the energy transition will come with dramatic impacts to landscapes and land use. It's really a socio-spatial problem. In order to decarbonize effectively, American energy historian David Nye has argued, countries such as the US need not only a, uh, what he calls a technological fix, but a whole regi regime change in the public's relationship with energy policy and carbon intensity. Part of what is needed beyond just engineering and, uh, and law is a strong cultural case for landscape transformation that incorporates a socio-spatial approach to the patterns of energy generation and transmission, energy use, and urban form. Landscape is an important site of contestation for the deployment of clean energy. Because landscape is a synthetic discipline which brings together the biophysical and ecological behavior of sites with the cultural modes of interacting with the land, so uh, cultural modes like how people settle, alter, think about, and reshape the landscape, then it is on the landscape that political tensions in the clean energy transition play out and where they might be diffused. An energy transition is always a combination of pure engineering on the one hand, but also of economics, political forces, and socio-cultural attitudes and priorities. And so as Dutch landscape architect Dirk Simmons has written, space and landscape is the socio-political arena in which all these factors come together and the battlefield where it will be won or lost, where the uh, energy transition will be won or lost. Now, if design is to operate on the shaping of energy systems, it needs to understand the components and building blocks of that system. So looking at this historically, we can separate out several components that structure infrastructural space and territory. The fuel sources, which come from extraction landscapes, the creation of the routes built to carry the energy to consumers, which we can call the conduits, and the spatial patterns of settlement and industry, the factories, industrial areas, worker housing, towns and cities. And again, looking historically, we can track how previous energy regimes and their associated infrastructures created new patterns of inequality in how the wealth of environmental impacts got distributed. For example, we can see the inequalities between the rural areas of production versus urban areas of consumption between the city versus its hinterland, the way wealth accrued to factory owners versus to laborers, and to places located near the conduits versus further away. If we look for lessons from, coal -based, uh, from the coal-based energy regime, from early electrification, mainly hydropower, or from the oil and gas-based energy regime of the 20th century, how might we predict the patterns of how new energy regimes, such as those emerging from our new clean energy transition, would distribute these benefits and burdens? We might ask, for example, how have previous energy transitions been politically contested? And um, how have they taken root despite opposition? And what lessons can we use generally to accelerate the current clean energy clean energy transition. In parallel, how did these prior energy transitions resonate in the imagery and cultural imagination of their time? And what does that tell us about their cultural cachet and their power dynamics? What about a particular technology causes it to be viewed as either an ugly imposition on the landscape, examples here, um, as the uh, ill-fitting machine in the garden, perhaps, as described in Leo Marx's book of that name. And when does it appear instead as, a, uh, as an exquisite machine uh, in some kind of resonant harmony with its landscape? How do we understand imagery such as Charles Sheeler's painterly celebrations of technological progress within the long tradition of landscape aesthetics, for example? Um, which might include uh, you know, uh, traditions of the picturesque and the sublime, 
but also ways in which such aesthetic concepts and imagery became applied to the conservation, protection, and design of actual sublime landscapes, from the natural wonders such as Niagara Falls to the iconic natural national parks of the American West. And at key moments in prior energy transitions, there have been examples when these technological objects of an energy regime have collided head on, to quote David Nye, with quintessential objects of the natural sublime. And so Nye has written about the case of the hydroelectric dam and the hydroelectric powered factory coming um, into direct conflict at Niagara Falls, where the, um, where the technological object of the hydroelectric plant uh, was literally subsuming the flow that powered the natural sublime of the falls. There have been numerous examples of such landscape collisions in US energy history, especially with hydroelectric dams. Um, so is this an extraction territory or sublime landscape? And it's really uh, in the eye of the beholder. But one idea that um, has helped to maybe unify this binary is the concept of the technological sublime popularized by Nye. In this case, the engineered technological object itself took on qualities of the sublime where uh, you know, in the 1920s, for example, uh, people would travel to see these infrastructures even as they were being built, uh, make pilgrimages to the Hoover Dam under construction, and used language very similar to that of the natural sublime to describe their feelings upon seeing these places. The big Colorado River dams, the Tennessee Valley Authority, and Bonneville Power Authority dams all understood and manipulated this concept to their benefit celebrating the confrontation with natural landscapes and using design as an intermediary to bring the visitor on this journey of cele celebrating this uh, uh, engineering prowess. So scale, the sense of awe and wonder, these are central concepts within the idea of the technological sublime. And Nye has written about how aside from the dams that supplied the electricity, uh, maybe the, the silently humming electric factory of the um, 40s um, uh, would have itself taken on uh, you know, some of these qualities as an object of the technological sublime in its day, especially in contrast to the dirty, noisy, and coal-fired steam power um, that everyone uh, would have come to know uh, and been familiar with at that time. And so, you know, can we leverage those understandings of cultural resonance to push for new aesthetic categories that might avoid the problem of Leo Marx's machine in the garden? For some, the technological sublime can be leveraged. Um, and we're interested in how do we do that more effectively um, to speed up the uh, clean energy transition. But in order to do that, we need to design the visitor into the experience of the energy landscape. So what new narratives of the, technical, of the technological object within the cultural landscape can we uh, start to create? Um, what new narratives of labor and energy work are needed to replace that persistent image of the energy worker as the you know, hard-hatted uh, coal miner or oil rigger, and usually the hard-hatted uh, male and white hard-hatted coal miner or oil rigger? How can a closeness with the unfamiliar technological object of the new clean energy regime help to coalesce a stronger consensus around the energy transition? So these are, you know, kind of one category of question. And then there are questions of space, the ways that the typical energy installation hits the ground, for example, um, as may be seen here um, as a monofunctional piece of engineered technology, barely integrated into its surrounding landscape, whose main message is really keep out. As designers, we can do a better job of making sure that energy technologies don't dominate their nearby landscape, that they use synergies and co-location with other beneficial uses to form more productive spatial relationships to create new value, to get beyond the monofunctional. As a counterpoint, perhaps, we might look to countries that have longer experience with renewable energy technologies and a stronger culture of design and planning. So uh, as just one example of design taking a stronger role, um, here we have an example from the Netherlands where the designers evaluated an existing energy landscape, which in this case was full of ad hoc 
and solitary wind turbines of numerous makes, models, heights, and colors that had been added over time since the 1970s in this particular polder. And then developed rules for cleaning up the geometric arrangement and rhythm with which visitors encountered these turbines as they traversed the landscape. This is part of a spatial quality plan for wind energy um, that strove to guide future development of turbines in the Waringer Mir polder. And the designer's goal here was to produce um, and to quote from, from, their, from their document, to produce a number of clear linear installations that form a recognizable new layer in the cultural landscape and match the scale of the project and the size of the polder itself, while more than doubling the installed capacity of wind power. So uh, organizing it, cleaning it up while repowering and kind of making it more efficient. Here they aim to achieve uh, quote, the greatest possible order, rhythm, and regularity, which um, evaluated visual conflicts having to do with perspectival effects of lines crossing one another in a messy way, of stacking up behind one another, or of jumping scale. And in operating on the new technological layer that is being added onto the agricultural landscape, the design team was really looking for opportunities to craft new functional linkages to recreation and to historical landscape patterns while recognizing and clarifying the meaning of the new energy layer on the existing landscape. So this case study got written up along with a few others in a paper for the Visual Resources Stewardship Conference last year, where my co-author and I proposed um, not to treat renewable energy as an intrusion into the landscape that must be mitigated or kept as far away as possible, but rather as a new layer to be integrated into the cultural landscape, which can create a positive new landscape experience despite their close proximity. In another European example, the Danish government, um, in this case, routinely hires landscape architecture firms as consultants to review the proposed siting of wind turbines in the landscape and to develop proactive plans for renewable infrastructure. So in Denmark, municipalities are responsible for designating, designating areas that are suitable for wind development through a municipal planning process that, um, uh, and I quote, gives full consideration to neighboring residences, to nature, the landscape, cultural historical values, etc., and of course the possibility of harvesting the wind resource. <laughs> um, and then the landscape is analyzed and recommendations made. So uh, wind turbines, the Danish Nature Agency writes in this pamphlet called Large Wind Turbines in the Open Country. So wind turbines are not only considered as a problem to be hidden as much as possible, but as something that contributes to the solution of modern society's need for energy. And it directs users to consider ways that they can add a new dimension to the landscape and its dynamics, as well as giving positive landscape experiences, end quote. So this kind of attitude is intended to prevent the kind of monofunctional, out of scale energy development that really characterized the United States early experience with renewable energy in places like um, Tehachapi Pass in California, which have become known since pejoratively as quote unquote wind walls. Um, so California was an early adopter of renewable technologies in the 70s and unfortunately opted for uh, kind of hands-off approach to energy development, resulting in examples like Tehachapi Pass, like Altamont Pass, where cacophonously arranged um, uh, machines at various heights and elevations, composed of numerous turbines, turbine makes and models, and spinning at different speeds and at different directions, um, constituted a, a total absence of design. And similarly, early California solar thermal projects sparked green-on-green uh, -green battles, right? So energy, uh, renewable energy advocates versus um, uh, conservationists and wildlife advocates. Because of projects like this impact to sensitive desert habitats and to the privatization of beloved public landscapes. And so through design, um, it seems that maybe conflicts in the renewable energy transition could be avoided or at least reduced 
and energy technology can become a valued layer of the cultural landscape, not an alien invasion that upsets local values and local landmarks. Each energy technology has different constraints, environmental impacts, aesthetic baggage, um, and different opportunities for co-location and multifunctionality. In Denmark and the Netherlands, um, we see some of the best examples of kind of restrained and geometrically considered wind developments. Um, uh, solar too can be carefully designed to coexist with other uses, such as these examples on the bottom um, that enhance agriculture, grazing, and pollinator habitat. Um, examples from uh, Germany and from the US Midwest um, that are being called agrivoltaics. Iceland, of course, has its famous multi-purpose Blue Lagoon, which started as a waste landscape for geothermal brine before it was recognized as a fantastic spa resort tourism destination and kind of elevated from just a simple, uh, you know, functional um, energy landscape into really an attraction and a destination. And South Korea and China have been experimenting with massive arrays of what are called photovoltaics, floating photovoltaic panels that reconfigure the surface of lakes and reservoirs with enormous productive uh, solar energy arrays while leaving the shoreline uh, really unaffected. So um, the conceptualization of the landscape and its aesthetics is one source of tension. Um, that impacts energy technology and landscape. And then another one is the tension between the urban and the rural. And so just to focus in on this uh, one for a second, um, we can think about the difference in attitude between seeing a renewable energy technology as just one more layer on top of an already working landscape. As for example, some farmers might see a wind or solar array in an agricultural context versus an unacceptable imposition in an Arcadian nature or an affront to the aspirational ruralism that some people um, uh, have moved to the countryside specifically to seek out. And usually, uh, you know, this uh, uh, finger points to wealthier urban retirees, for example, that really are seeking kind of an aspirational ruralism and, and carry with them a pastoral um, idea of the countryside. As with previous energy transition, the city and the countryside are not equal in terms of their power dynamics. Uh, one is the consumption region, the other more, uh, more often seen as the extraction territory. Um, and so this, you know, uh, this creates uh, some predictable tensions. As social scientist Ben Sovacool has documented, um, rural residents uh, resent urban developers who wish to build wind farms in their midst. Um, or in other cases, actually rural residents want renewable power projects for their own use as a vehicle for economic development and resent what seems like meddling by urban residents intent on preserving the countryside for its scenic and recreational values. So while these questions of aesthetics and conceptualizations of landscape are important, with energy infrastructure, the questions of control, of ownership, of scale, and of who benefits become even more central. And that's kind of what we see here. The question of centralization and decentralization is key in discussions of control. So is it a set of assets controlled by a large energy company or utility located far away? Or is it instead a decentralized microgrid controlled by a network of homeowners or local investors, for example, or a energy cooperative? The fossil fuel energy regime, for example, is dominated by the model of top-down centralized control and ownership because that's the kind of uh, legalized monopoly that existed when that system was being built out. Um, and in that case, you know, the, uh, the centralized players, such as electrical utilities, have a self-interest in resisting the renewable energy transition in order to defend their existing built assets, their power plants, their centralized power stations, because they represent some costs. But even if we see a wholesale switch to renewable energy, will we automatically have a decentralized landscape of small energy cooperatives and individual owners, more democratic by nature, or Will the future privileges privilege the same kind of large-scale players? 
but in this case invested in renewables. Will we see a replication of the power dynamics and their associated spatial patterns of previous energy transitions, but with renewable energy instead of fossil energy um, as the kind of you know, top-down dominant player? This is the central question between the face-off between you know, uh, what uh, uh, myself and um, some collaborators like uh, Daniel Cohen call big clean versus an energy democracy model of control over energy resources. And energy democracy is an idea that posits that people and communities have a right to control their energy futures, but that transformative and radical change will only happen through a shift away from a profit-driven energy industry towards a more democratic control and social ownership of energy resources, infrastructure, and infrastructure planning. And so this debate between whether the renewable energy transition will be dominated by market forces and energy consolidation by the big players, some of whom are the same kind of guilty parties that have been really uh, you know, the big players in the fossil fuel energy regime but are now getting into the renewables game, um, or be primarily publicly controlled, has really burst onto the surface with the Green New Deal agenda um, advanced by environmental and climate justice groups um, and with um, campaigns like Public Power championed by DSA chapters across the U.S. And so the Green New Deal draws rhetorically on the original 1930s New Deal and regular, regularly references the kinds of government programs of the Roosevelt administration that advanced a largely egalitarian energy policy through agencies such as the Rural Electrification Administration, which really um, uh, were striving to dramatically expand access to affordable electricity for rural farmers when the private market had utterly failed to do so. Um, and so the, you know, the, the Green New Deal from the start has had this kind of agenda, um, really a three-pronged agenda of decarbonization, while uh, a very rapid decarbonization, right, while prioritizing green jobs and social justice. Um, since the Green New Deal arrived on the scene, uh, most visibly in really the last two years, the, uh, the, the urgency the, the kind of uh, crisis of climate change um, has only swelled, um, but also the urgency of jobs and justice have grown amid what is increasingly looking like a deep economic recession, um, the dramatic inequalities in public health outcomes, um, in terms of coronavirus infection and death rates for people of color, and kind of a wholesale racial reckoning uh, a kind of a, a racial justice reckoning in the United States in the wake of the uh, murder of George Floyd. And so the climate emergency has only become more, more salient, but any response to it that doesn't also address festering racial inequalities and climate vulnerabilities, or kind of the, the passing of an economic stimulus without ensuring that it is also a green stimulus, has really come to seem irresponsible to many and more than a missed opportunity. So thanks to the Green New Deal framework and the solidifying progressive consensus around um, climate jobs and justice, these three kind of facets are becoming increasingly uh, seen as inextric inextric inextricably linked. So where does that leave design and landscape? Um, there's currently a short window of opportunity that is open to developing and adopting principles of good design for the energy landscape, which can be adopted to ensure participatory design and incorporation of local values, um, but really that uh, you know, designers need to act now in order to be ready when this inevitable investment um, actually comes about. It's clear that in any version of a Green New Deal, there will need to be a massive expansion, for example, of the electrical transmission grid, just as one tangible example of where designers need to develop a, uh, uh, kind of a, a, landscape, um, uh, a landscape and investment and infrastructural agenda. Um, but the transmission grid uh, is currently one of the major bottlenecks to faster renewable energy build-out 
but it's already clear that the thousands of miles of new and upgraded transmission lines will be fiercely contested by nearby landowners, um, wilderness advocates, those that don't want to see this infrastructure in their backyard or this machine in their garden. Um, pipeline battles led by landowners and indigenous water protectors have demonstrated leadership in contesting um, fossil fuel energy uh, infrastructure. But some of these same concerns about technology in the landscape could easily be uh, transposed against the necessary conduits of a renewable energy regime, like um, transmission, for example. Um, so is there, a des is there a way for design and public ownership to assuage landscape concerns and really respond to, um, to uh, concerns of environmental justice while making good on, let's say, long discussed ideas of the transmission system as a multi-use spine, a public access or economic investment. Um, what can we learn from successful examples of built publicly accessible transmission line easements, which already function as multi-use trails um, in places like Seattle um, or, or Los Angeles? Or perhaps landscape designers need to ally themselves with coalitions that will insist on a redistributive model of infrastructure investment, which kind of more actively treats communities along the line as, um, as beneficiaries and makes urban residents pay a little bit extra to ensure, um, you know, to, to bury the line or otherwise ensure that the countryside uh, gets a better outcome. Kind of uh, trying to bridge a little bit this traditional inequality between the city and the hinterland. And as designers working in energy landscapes, um, can we always keep the extraction territory front and center in our concerns as we do this work? So just as an example here, the renewable energy regime has different patterns of extraction than the fossil fuel one. Um, but there is still an extraction landscape. So most obvious, um, most obviously visible uh, is in the lithium flats of the Chilean Atacama Desert and in the cobalt mines of the Congo, which produce the lithium, the cobalt, the rare earths um, that are critically needed for the technologies of the clean energy transition. Um, and so, you know, do we need to expand our geography of concern up the supply chain and out to this new extraction territory. Um, yes, right, we, we need to ensure that the Green New Deal must be internationalist and anti-extractivist. Uh, you know, a, a closed loop system of recycling and resource recovery is not too much to ask for. And if we design with this in mind, you know, we can uh, really highlight and, and center that conversation to really make sure that um, those uh, communities that are in the new sacrifice zone or extraction territory uh, really get to drive the design of that system. Dystopian outcomes of indiscriminate renewable deployment are easy to picture, but they're misleading. Because if deployed smartly, there's more than enough land available to power the world with clean energy many times over while avoiding the adverse impacts to food supply or to beloved natural landscapes. Um, but insisting on multifunctional, well-designed energy landscapes must put people first and their cultural landscapes first. It must carefully consider questions of ownership, of energy security and control, and avoid the creation of new hinterlands or new sacrifice zones. What we urgently need are bold visions of an energy future that accelerates the energy transition through design, that curates new relationships between technology and daily experience, that democratizes energy access, that reimagines green jobs as good and fulfilling jobs, that rethinks urban rural binaries, that reimagines what we call infrastructure to include social infrastructure and care work, that fleshes out a just transition which resonates with what people care about in their daily lives and in their nearby landscapes, that builds community resilience to the inevitable stresses of climate change, that replaces extraction with the work of repair. And so here are just some examples that students in my seminar last year came up with, um, work by Ira, by Ashna, Camila, 
um, Yuni, Han, Tianshuo, Cheyenne, and Gustavo. And we need many more examples like this at different time scales for different places and landscapes for various audiences. Um, so many uh, different examples that will resonate with particular audiences and find a balance between uh, big ideas and the unique nuances of place. As designers, we've been standing on the sidelines of the energy transition, designing around the edges. But it's time to dive in and get our hands dirty because the uh, energy transition is coming. Um, there will be massive demand to scale up very quickly, and we, we may be called on soon enough, so we need to get prepared now. Thank you very much. A big welcome to all of our incoming new students, and I look forward to seeing you all very soon at Penn.